Welcome guys and girls to another interview preparation video. In this video, we are going to go over 10 questions that you must know before you go to your cloud DevOps interview. The questions we are going to cover today are, give me a couple examples where vertical scaling is appropriate. So you probably know the difference between horizontal scaling and vertical scaling, and you know where horizontal scaling is used. There are some use cases where vertical scaling is appropriate. Do you know them? Next question, name three AWS services that can run Kubernetes on AWS. What are the advantages of using cloud? What are some benefits and challenges of DevOps? So everyone knows the benefits, but this is to test out, uh, to see if you actually worked in DevOps and are there any challenges? Next question, what are cloud computing deployment models? What is shared responsibility model? Can you explain the model for EKS or Elastic Kubernetes service? What is edge computing? Can you give me an example? How do you calculate cost for your project in AWS? Would you choose ECS, EKS or Lambda for your system design interview to design a system that the interviewer give you? What is your favorite service on AWS? How will you improve it? What is IAS versus PaaS versus SaaS? And last question, tell me about yourself. Uh, so I said 10 questions, but I added last two questions because I thought those are equally important that you should know before you go for your cloud DevOps interview. As always, timestamps are included for your viewing convenience. For those of you who are new to the channel, hello folks, my name is Raj. I'm a senior specialist architect for containers and serverless at AWS. I'm also a best-selling Udemy and Pluralsight author, public speaker, and guest lecturer. Previously, I was a distinguished cloud architect at Verizon. Also, all my best-selling and highest-rated courses are on sale in Udemy right now. I'll give the link down below. Even though the prices are showing $50, $30, you have the maximum discount right now. Check it out if you're interested, but if you don't want to buy any courses, totally fine. Still love you guys and girls. All right, with that, let's get started. So the first question is, give me a couple examples where vertical scaling is appropriate. Uh, so one of the example is scaling your Amazon database instances or relational database service instances. So when you scale something horizontally, that means more servers come up. IDS, let's say you are running a particular IDS instance and it reached the limit of the CPU and memory, the easiest way to scale that up is vertical scaling because with vertical scaling, you do not need to change the connection parameters. Uh, so you simply move to a bigger with more CPU, more memory IDS instance. You can also scale your databases horizontally, but they are mostly for read performance. Uh, so when you add more servers to Amazon IDS, uh, you can use them as read replica where the primary instance is doing all the writes and then it is doing asynchronous repli replication to all those read replicas. Uh, so that's one example. Another example of vertical scaling is for Kubernetes using vertical pod autoscaler. Uh, so this is used to right size your pod. Uh, so you should always specify request and limits for your pod, but in the beginning, you don't know what to put in request and limits. So you can use this vertical pod autoscaler where the pod will scale vertically to adjust the CPU and memory to run the applications uh, optimally when the traffic is coming in. And at the end, it will give you that, okay, this is the request and this is the limit that you should use. And then when you go to production, you could use those numbers. Okay, next question. So this is a little tricky one. Name three AWS services that can run Kubernetes on AWS. Feel free to pause the video and try to think of the three services that can run Kubernetes. All right, so number one, pretty straightforward, is Elastic Kubernetes Service or EKS. Probably you folks guess that. The second one is Amazon EC2. You can self-manage your Kubernetes because you can get the EKS open source distribution and then put it on EC2 and you manage your own control plan. Even though it's painful, but you might have your own reasons to manage everything on EC2. Third service is ROSA or Red Hat OpenShift in AWS. So Red Hat OpenShift runs an opinionated Kubernetes version. 
Uh, so basically, it gives you the DevOps pipeline, the scaling is easier, you just click a couple things, and it configures all the horizontal pod autoscaler, cluster autoscaler for you. Uh, but yeah, those are the three AWS services where you can run Kubernetes. All right, so next question is super important. Name some of the advantages of the cloud. So do not try to think of stuff, right? When you get this question, ideally you should already know this. And there is a clearly documented benefit and that's what interviewers are looking for. Uh, there are the six advantages of cloud computing. Uh, so if you interact with anyone from AWS and you have asked, why should I use AWS? You would hear these things. You won't uh, hear us trying to think and come out, come up with something. Uh, so I'm gonna go over this list, but you should absolutely memorize at least three of it, and I'm gonna go over which three. Uh, so the first one is trade fixed expense for variable expense, right? Because uh, a cloud is pay as you go, so if you use less, you pay less, uh, whereas with fixed expense, you need to invest money in data center, all the servers, so even if uh, you are not using the full capacity, but you are paying for the uh, peak traffic. Second one is related to the first one, benefit from massive economies of scale. When you move to cloud, you achieve a lower variable cost than you can get on your own uh, because usage from hundreds of customers is aggregated in the cloud. Uh, providers such as AWS can achieve higher economics of scale because companies are just building one data center at a time, but AWS has massive data centers where they are running projects for all these companies, so you get the advantages of the economies of scale. So next one is an important one, and you should memorize this one. Stop guessing capacity. For the data center, generally you provision way more servers and way more real estate than you need because you guess what could be the peak traffic. With cloud, you can scale up and scale down. So if uh, during Black Friday or some shopping event, your project needs more infrastructure. That's you know, with cloud computing, you can just turn on more servers, use it, and then scale down. So you can assess as much or as little capacity as you need and scale up and down as required with only a few minutes notice. So you should definitely mention this. So next one is equally important, increase speed and agility. Uh, so let's say your company wants to try out a new database maybe DynamoDB or Amazon RDS, or want to try some serverless. With traditional non-cloud environment, you need to procure license, procure server, all that stuff. But with cloud, with just a click of a button, you can provision a NoSQL database, try out Amazon RDS, Lambda, etc. If you are a new company, you don't even have to buy a data center. You can try everything in the cloud and deploy it. That's why cloud gives you increased speed and agility. Next one is stop spending money running and maintaining data centers. So if you have your own data center, uh, you need to make sure there are sufficient air condition, electricity, backup electricity, disaster recovery, etc. With AWS, AWS does all that for you. So you can just focus on your business. And this last one is also super important. You should memorize this one, Glo global in minutes. So let's say today your company works only in United States, but tomorrow you want to expand to Europe. Now imagine without cloud, you need to buy real estate in Europe. You need to uh, build or rent a place, get all the servers, uh, hire people, all that stuff. With AWS, you can just deploy your applications in Europe in minutes. So basically if today I'm running something in USA, and I want to deploy it to Europe, super easy. I run my infrastructure as code and I can go global. Uh, so you should definitely remember this one, go global in minutes, increase speed and agility and stop guessing capacity. So definitely mention these benefits. Like I said, don't try to think of other stuff during the interview. So next question, what are some of the DevOps benefits and challenges? So benefits a little easier, challenges a little tricky, but I'll go over the benefits first. Uh, so when it comes to benefits, there are two big areas. One is the technical benefit, next is cultural benefits. Technical benefits is faster software delivery, faster problem remediation, easier to replicate best practices. So basically, if you have a DevOps tool chain with all the security best practices built in, and then you want to replicate this 
to another region or another environment such as staging, dev, test, another production environment. Super easy. You will have a pipeline as code, infrastructure as code. You can just rerun it, point it to the new environment. That's it. Everything is good. All the best practices get replicated. And since all of this stuff is automated with DevOps, there is more time to innovate rather than fixing and maintaining. Some of the cultural benefits, now that developers and the operation folks are uh, working together in the DevOps model, improve communication and collaboration. In some cases, the same person will learn both the development as well as operations. There are a lot of cool DevOps tools. So once you learn that, there are greater professional opportunities and it leads to more happier, productive teams. Uh, and if you can mention this metric in your interview, interviewer will be super impressed. So you could mention that there is a study that Puppet has run uh, on the organization who has adopted DevOps versus non-DevOps organizations. And DevOps organization have 4x lower change failure rate, 24 times faster recovery times, 200 times more frequent deployments, and 44% more time spent on new features and code. Uh, so obviously it's very difficult to remember all these numbers in your interview, uh, but you could say that DevOps organizations have faster recovery time and 200 times more frequent deployments. And regarding frequent deployments, you can mention one of these examples. So Amazon, yeah, go Amazon. Uh, the code is deployed every 11.7 seconds. Coca-Cola deployed delivery times, reduced delivery times from hours to minutes. Netflix code deployed thousand times per day. So I'm a little biased for Amazon. So you can, you can uh, mention the Amazon example. Now let's go over the DevOps challenges. So one of the big challenges DevOps is you need to continuously adapt to changing landscape. Uh, there are new tools coming out every week and you should name some of these tools uh, on the DevOps tool chain itself. There is Jenkins, there is GitLab, there is AWS code pipelines, Pinnacle, etc. There are new processes and technologies. So very difficult to keep on learning all these new tools. Second challenge is since in DevOps model, uh, the same person will be doing development as well as production support. Sometimes developers are unwilling to provide support because developers sometimes want to do cool stuff. But then when it comes to production issue, uh, it might be a little challenging. And since DevOps requires cultural change, you know, in theory, it says yes, the same group is doing developer operations, but in reality, big organizations have these big groups, developer group, operation group. So who takes over the group? There could be some political fighting, cultural changes, so it takes months and years to ramp up. And finally, this one is true. We humans sometimes are resistant to change. This changes a lot in the technical process as well as the cultural process, uh, so there will be resistance. So generally in interviews, whenever you mention a challenge, interviewer will ask, okay, can you tell me how do you solve a particular challenge? So that kind of shows that actually you have done some of it and not just saying the challenge. So regarding continuously adapt to changing landscape, you could say that uh, we have a cloud center of excellence who goes and evaluates the tools instead of everyone uh, going crazy. And then they established standard tool sets. You could give an example that for my organization, we decided to go with CloudFormation as infrastructure as code and Jenkins as our DevOps tool chain. And that's what we use. And the Cloud Center of Excellence provides template with best practices built in. So if a new project comes in, uh, they can just copy over the Jenkins file as well as the CloudFormation and get started rather than starting from scratch. Uh, developers are unwilling to provide support. So you could say that your project has deployed some rotation criteria so that uh, not one person is doing support for multiple weeks. You get extra incentives uh, when you are supporting. Takes months and years, so you could say that we utilized a third party training partners. We did workshops uh, to train ourselves in those tools that we decided on uh, and for the resistance to change. Really not an easy answer because technical changes are easier uh, but we humans are complex, right? Um, so you could say we went through cultural training as we are going through the cultural change. At the same time, the third party technical training, we realized that if I learn DevOps, it's not just good for this project and this company, 
it really opens up a lot of doors for my career. And then I was open to the change because if I learned these new DevOps tools, DevOps methodologies, down the line, I can get a high paying job. Next question, what is edge computing? Can you give me an example? So what does edge mean? Edge means something that is outside of your data center, either your own data center or AWS's data center. Uh, so one example could be smart cars or elect electric vehicles like Tesla. Uh, so if you think about it, the car itself is doing a lot of computation. For example, if it has autopilot, it must do all the calculations on the car itself because uh, let's say there is some dangerous situation going on in the road and then the Tesla sends all that data back to the data center, data center calculates what the car should do, send it back, it will be too late, the accident will happen because there will be latency to send back and forth all this data over a wireless network. Instead, what Tesla does is it computes everything on the car itself so the, the machine learning model is running on the car and then using the sensors, it gathers the data, calculates and decides that it's a dangerous situation and then change lane or do whatever it does to uh, prevent the accident. So that's one of the great examples today for edge computing. I'll give you another example. So let's say a winery or a vineyard or even your garden. Uh, so in the olden days, you needed to know what is the uh, weather be like is the sun hot so then you need to water your uh, grapes or your uh, vegetables in a certain way today we have iot sensors so these iot sensors uh, can have intelligence that hey if the humidity of the soil is less than this then turn on the sprinkler in this case also uh, it is not sending everything back to the data center to process the IoT itself has some uh, smart capabilities and if the rules are satisfied, then it's taking some action. So I believe as the time goes, edge computing will become more and more uh, popular, especially with the rise of electric vehicles. Next question, how do you calculate cost for your project in AWS? Uh, so we talked about cloud computing benefits. So the interviewer might ask, okay, so you created your architecture but you need to know how much your project is gonna cost before you go in. How are you gonna do that? So AWS provides a pricing calculator. So you can click create estimate. You can select um, the service such as Amazon EKS if you're running in Kubernetes. And then you can configure number of clusters, how many hours, how many EC2, all that stuff. It will give you the cost. This part is quite straightforward. The thing I wanted you folks to think is uh, sometimes if you are in a hybrid model where some projects are running in the data center, some projects are running on the cloud, uh, there is a temptation to compare just the compute cost. So uh, you would say, okay, EKS coming a little bit more expensive than if I run um, Kubernetes in my own data center. So you always have to think that the cost is not just compute cost, it's the total cost of ownership. Uh, so when you run your uh, projects on AWS or any other cloud in that matter, you are saving money on maintenance and management, right? Because you don't need to manage your own data center. Uh, you don't need to hire people uh, to manage the servers and all that stuff. So total cost of ownership is always low. And if you mention that to the interviewer, interviewer will be really impressed, especially if you're going for uh, cloud DevOps jobs. There is a really good paper that Deloitte published determining the total cost of ownership. Uh, this is just for serverless, uh, but I'm gonna share the link in the descriptions. Uh, what this paper does is it takes particular use cases such as a transportation company evaluating AWS Lambda over Amazon EC2, and then it goes over like compute cost, uh, and then the total cost of ownership, management cost, etc it kind of gives you a perspective that, okay, not everything is just the compute cost because that's just one component. Sometimes it's more expensive to manage data centers or manage virtual machines. So next question, would you choose ECS, EKS or Lambda for system design interview? So when I talk about system design interview, I mean that interviewer will give you like application to design 
and then you have to come up with the design, go over different factors. Or it could be a general system design interview without designing anything. The interviewer might say, hey, I have an application. It needs to scale super high uh, for a particular time. I'll give you a scenario and then ask you how would you solve it. So I have many videos on the differences between serverless versus container or AWS ECS versus EKS versus Fargate, containers on AWS, right? So you can check them out. But always go with the service that you are most comfortable with. So if you know a lot about EC2, give the answer with EC2 because you know that the most because you will always get deep dive follow up questions. If you know a lot about Kubernetes, go with Kubernetes. If you know a lot about Lambda, go with Lambda. But there is a tendency, you sometimes folks think that Kubernetes is super cool right now. Uh, so then the interviewer asks the question and you go, yes, I will use Elastic Kubernetes service. But if you say that, then you need to know these four things. One, how would you scale Kubernetes applications? How will you secure Kubernetes application? How will you make the application highly available? And how will you cost optimize, right? So it's true for all, all these uh, three or more technologies. So even though I did not say EC2, you could say EC2, as long as you know EC2 in and out. And also the fifth thing that would be good is to uh, remember the limitations. So all these technologies have limitations, ECS, EKS, Lambda, EC2, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's good to know, but at least you need to know those four factors. Next question, what is your favorite service on AWS and how will you improve it? So you can pick any service you want. Actually, I like AWS Lambda. I like Amazon Elastic Kubernetes service. But the second part is the trick one that I wanted to go through. How will you improve it? So obviously, if you have worked on the service, you should have noticed some feature that would be nice. So you can mention that. Uh, but if you are not sure, you can always look up roadmaps. So you could say my favorite service is Amazon EKS or Elastic Kubernetes service. And what are some things that you will improve? Just look at the roadmap that AWS publishes and you can pick one of these features. So for example, uh, under coming soon, you could say that you have a lot of uh, graphical workload. I mean, don't say if you don't know about graphical workload, but you could say the managed node group for bottle rocket with the NVIDIA GPU will be nice. Or you can look at some stuff which is on the researching phase and say those. So of course, Kubernetes is open source and all the containers roadmap uh, for AWS is open source. So this is a little easier. Uh, if you say Lambda, so either you need to think through if you have worked, what features would be nice. Uh, so another quick hack is you can look for the latest releases like AWS Lambda releases, and then you can click the newest feature. So for example, this Lambda function URL uh, currently you have AWS IAM or none. So basically um, it can be controlled using either IAM or you keep it open. So you could say that, um, yes, I love Lambda. I really like this new feature Lambda function URL, which gives me a URL even without using API gateway or load balancer. So I can directly invoke my Lambda from outside, uh, but it only supports AWS IAM as the security authentication authorization feature. I would like to have Cognito integrated with Lambda, right? So, so if you have not worked in something that much in deep level, you can look at the new feature, study a little bit and think that what more could be added. So the next question is what are cloud computing deployment models, right? So again, like the advantages of cloud, you must know this, you cannot think through this in the interview itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'll give the link. You can Google cloud computing deployment models and this AWS page will come up. So there are three deployment models. The cloud, you already know, everything's running on the cloud. Uh, hybrid is a mix of on-premises and the cloud. And on-premises is where you are running everything on-premises. Uh, I'm not gonna go deep on it because the names are self-explanatory and you can study a little bit. You might uh, get a little surprised when you hear this and if you did not know this, uh, you won't be able to answer it. Like you probably know what is cloud hybrid on-premises, but you probably did not know they are termed as cloud computing deployment models. Next question, what is shared responsibility model? Can you explain the model for EKS? 
So shared responsibility model means the security and compliance is shared responsibility between AWS and the customer. So AWS is responsible for security of the cloud. So basically AWS is responsible for protecting the infrastructure that runs all of the services offered in the AWS cloud. And this infrastructure is composed of hardware, software, networking, and facilities that run AWS services. But the customer is responsible for security in the cloud. So for example, if you are running your application in Lambda, because you probably already know about EC2, uh, so Lambda is running on some underlying infrastructure that AWS is managing. So it is AWS's responsibility to make sure that the underlying Lambda infrastructure is secure. But the code you are writing, it's your responsibility to make sure they are secure. Uh, so if your code is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, that you need to take a look and uh, put preventive measures. So I specifically said, can you explain the model for EKS because EKS could be a little tricky. Uh, so EKS runs in two different modes. One is when you are when you are running the worker nodes on EC2, and another way is when you are running on EKS Fargate. Uh, so when you are running on worker mode model, the control plane of course is AWS responsibility, AWS running in its own hardware. But the self-managed workers are actually your responsibility. Like uh, you are choosing the operating system, Kubelet, CRI, AMI. AWS will help you with this, such as if you are using EKS optimized AMI, AWS, if there is a security vulnerability, will release AMI. But then you need to make sure you upgrade your worker nodes to use the latest AMI. So it's kind of a mixed. And then for EKS Fargate, AWS manages the underlying operating system, Kubelet, CRI, so container runtime and AMI. Uh, AWS manages the worker node scaling because as uh, your uh, Fargate uh, comes to the limit and it uses horizontal power auto scaler, AWS will scale it. So study this. I'm going to give a link to this because this one is super important right now. So next question, what is IAS versus PaaS versus SaaS? I'm not going to go through it because there are so many videos on this on the internet, uh, but you can Google and this also comes under cloud computing models. So make sure if the interviewer asks you what are the different cloud computing models, you have to specify their IAS, PaaS, and SaaS, and then study these and name some of the services that falls under each of this category. So last question is tell me about yourself. Very important question because this question will come in the interview 100% of the time. So just a couple of tips. Sometimes people just elaborate their whole journey for like more than five minutes. Like every, every company they have been in, every major project they have been in. Treat this as a trailer of a movie and not the full movie or not even the review of the movie. The answer should be completed in two to three minutes. If it is longer than three minutes, you need to make it crisp. So like I said, like a movie trailer only shows the best parts of the movie and build some interest, you mention the absolute best projects you have done and how does those projects relate to this role, right? So uh, you don't need to go detail. You could say, I have done a project uh, which moved the entire uh, on-prem projects into Kubernetes and I have learned so much about scalability, security cost optimizations of Kubernetes that will be very useful for this role. And then you can mention a couple more. If you are not a fresher, you don't need to go over which college you went to, what uh, degree you have, all that stuff. But let's say you have AWS Solutions Architect Professional or DevOps Pro or a Kubernetes certification. Uh, after you go over your uh, Lighthouse projects, you could say, also, I was so interested in this topic that I got AWS Solutions Architect Professional on this. Don't ramble for minutes. So let me know if you want me to make a separate video just on tell me about yourself with some bad answer and good answer. Let's make a target. If this video gets, uh, I don't know, maybe like 200 likes and more than uh, 50 comments, I'll make that video. How about that? You folks do your part. I will do my part. Uh, if you found this video helpful, please click that like button. Smash it. If that's something you are into, subscribe to the channel, put comments, every like, subscribe, comment 
help this channel grow, help this video reach new viewers. That motivates me to do more videos for you guys and girls. Check out my courses. If interested, they are on sale this week. All right, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next video. Bye.